Gnosticism and established power. Big welcome to you. Um, recently, two contacts via YouTube. Um, both of them, I, I, I think, meant well. And in fact, one of them, I, I'm, I'm absolutely certain, means nothing but uh, nothing but good good towards me. Um, but they they asked me questions which made me think about a Gnostic understanding of religion and spirituality. And um, even a more, even looking at sort of evangelism and its sort of rather business-like approach to religion. I, I suppose also the business-like approaches to spirituality. Now, the first was related to the law of retraction, and the second was about the Muslim approach to Rukia, or you, you'd know it as exorcism. Now, as I say, I, I'm sure neither met, meant me any harm at all. I mean, one of them wishes me nothing but good. But it did encourage me to research some of what I think is purported to be knowledge, and indeed, some aspects that even I have believed to be knowledge. And I've got to say, I was a little shocked when I did some research at what I found. And I just wanted to, research, uh, to, to share it with you. Simple as that. Theosophy. Now, I've always been a little bit suspicious of what is called the New Age. Despite holding many beliefs which probably appear to you to be New Age beliefs. I personally trace the New Age to philosophy, uh, theosophy, which was a major spiritual movement in much of the world. I mean, particularly the West, but much of the world during the Victorian Eve, era. I possibly could have chosen Rosicrucianism to make my point and would have had very similar arguments to make about it. Uh, but, well, I've gone for theosophy. Theosophy began with Madame Helena Blavatsky, a, car a colourful character, to say the least. Now, I really do believe she was blessed with very strong paranormal powers, and wouldn't want to take those from her. She studied Eastern belief systems, including Buddhism and Hinduism, but especially Buddhism, and repackaged them for the West, drawing on the Neoplatonist uh, Platonist tradition. So many of her beliefs are very similar to my own Kajawan beliefs. Indeed, I once said that I had trodden, somewhat trodden, in her illustrious footsteps. Uh, while some suggest that uh, Kajawan was actually influenced by the theosophy of Dutch colonists, I'm not so certain it's true. I mean, there may have been some influence, but so many of these beliefs already existed in Java. Uh, because, of course, Hinduism and Buddhism already existed in Java. Madame Blavatsky herself exposed the subterfuge of the spiritualist movements, movement, also very popular in the West in Victorian times. So, I mean, she has to be commended for that. But it does strike me that when trying to convince others of your opinion, exposing the subterfuge of competing beliefs is a very subtle tactic indeed. In fact, when we were troubled with black magic, every dukan we went to was very keen to run down the last dukan that we'd been to see. It just strikes me as a, a normal tactic. tactic. It's, it's almost business, isn't it? But I want to say that Madame Blavatsky herself is not above criticism. There are some elements of her story which don't seem to add up. They, they do appear to be open to doubt. Theosophy really took off when it was introduced to America. 
It then began to incorporate some of the more materialist techniques of American capitalism. And that's really where my misgivings begin to start. Now, Annie Besant, the hero of the Match Girl strike, uh, and indeed uh, women's liberation and theosophy was associated with the early women's liberation movement. Rudolf Steiner, who developed anthroposophy, Thomas Edison, Alfred Russell Wallace, and even Mahatma Gandhi became followers of theosophy. A contemporary theosophist who I've got an awful lot of time for is Richard Smalley. Smalley. And it's, I, I really recommend you, you digging out his talks on YouTube. Not only does he talk in a, in a very sort of beautiful way, uh, but I find his ideas absolutely fascinating. Madame Blatak Blavatsky did many things. Many things from the New Age can be traced directly to her. I'm not saying she was always the pioneer in all of these things, but she certainly was fundamental in promoting them to the West. So, for example, yoga is something she promoted in the West. She introduced the ideas of reincarnation and karma to the West. She wrote about the law of attraction. Madame Blavatsky herself believed that she was aided or guided by what she called ascended masters. And you'll find the names of these ascended masters often incorporated into other people's tarot readings, such as Mary, Mother of Jesus, Archangel Gabriel, Saint Germain. She also had a view which I can't make up my mind whether it's racist or not, but certainly it could lead to racism, social Darwinism. And that was a view of root races, including the Lymorians and the Atlanteans. Uh, so the myth of Atlantis is very important to her. She had a belief in the Akashic records, which are a store for the knowledge of the universe. Now, along with Madame Blavatsky, theosophy itself is not without its controversies. Uh, Mancunian Alice Bailey developed theosophy in the US in some directions which certainly raise an eyebrow, should we say. Nevertheless, it was her who developed the concept of the age of Aquarius. Uh, but it's her influence on the United Nations that causes me the greatest concern. Alice Bailey much more directly influenced the New Age than Madame Blavatsky. And the wonderful album White Light, White Heat by Velvet Underground is a tribute to Alice Bailey. And David Icke is strongly influenced by the thoughts of Alice ba Bailey. Nevertheless, it's not my intention to do a hatchet job on theosophy, nor even on Alice Bailey. Uh, but in common with evangelists, their theories on how they influence contemporary thinking are always presented as though they're proven facts, uh, not open to debate, with the origins of these thoughts never referenced. So it's always very difficult to get to where, where these thoughts actually originate. And, you know, you can go into Buddhism and Hinduism to find the antecedents of some of what Madame Blav Blavatsky said. Uh, but often... I think it's enough to go as far as Madame Blavatsky. But, but rarely is she credited with being the originator of these thoughts. So, in short, debate isn't really encouraged. And we're simply told that either we don't understand, we don't know enough, or that we've not woken up. Very familiar terms in today's society. The New Age. Now, it's also not my intention to have a tirade against the New Age. 
just because of some of the aggressive business methods some practitioners use, especially on YouTube. After all, much of the new age is based on concepts that I would support. In other words, much of the new age is based on things that I do believe to be true. But they take it to a highly commercialised conclusion. They strip these concepts of their meanings and context and repackage them as commercial products. Now, when exploring the New Age, I would really recommend reading The Kabbalion, which is a brilliant introduction to New Age thinking. It purports to be derived from Hermes Trismus Gistus, but there's little evidence of this. Indeed, it's debatable if Hermes Trismegistus actually existed. The principles contained in it can be summed up as follows. Mentalism, that all is consciousness. Correspondence, and you've probably heard, as above, so below. Vibration, that everything vibrates, including ourselves. Polarity. Opposites on a, are on a continuum which attracts. Rhythm, that life is swings of, of ups and downs, that it goes in a rhythm. Cause and effect, causation. Agenda, that everything has a masculine and a feminine element. Now, it's very trendy at the moment to criticise the Kabbalion, and, you know, it's, it's very easy to criticise. In fact, it was actually written by William Walker Atkinson, a highly pro prolific author, which, along with Madame Bl Blavatsky, something of a colourful past. Now, I mentioned Madame Blavatsky introduced, or was fundamental in introducing yoga to the West, uh, but the yoga as practised today owes far more to New York than Indian origins. Indeed, we practise yoga as a part of meditation in Kajawan, uh, but it's really about breathing techniques. What I'd like to say is that I'm certain that yoga as practised in the West is, is very beneficial, beneficial to your posture and many things. Uh, but what I would argue is that it's been stripped of its context. And unfortunately, the more that New Agers attempt to find this context within Indian traditions, the more bizarre it becomes. Now, karma is something that I, I do believe in. Uh, but under the New Age, it's almost become you reap what you sow. Now, the universe does definitely seek balance. So there's, there's, there is some truth in it. Uh, but the New Age misses the importance of intergenerational karma. A reincarnation is also something that has resonance with some of my beliefs. Uh, but it's being completely oversimplified by the new, uh, new Age. Now, in fairness to the New Age, it has also been completely oversimplified in many Buddhist countries including Tibet, where although they have a complex set of beliefs around reincarnation, I really don't buy into it, despite New Ages, many New Ages, paying lip service to them. But what I'd really like to hone in on is this law of attraction. And it develops on the ideas of William Wal Walker Atkinson and Phineas Parkhurst Quimby a mentalist and mesmerist. Uh, but it was developed and repackaged by people like Napoleon Hill, Abraham Hicks, authors with even more checkered pasts. And now, we are what we think. So positive thinking must have some benefits for both our physical and mental health. So that's a good starting point. But the law of attraction is sold as a sort of get-rich programme. 
and my my biggest misgiving is that it is it is very much promoted within pyramid selling organizations or to use the posh word multi-level marketing um and it's part of what I would describe as a general trend to pathologise all problems to one's personal psychology, thereby diverting our attention away from what's happening in the world and the underlying power relationships within the world. This leads me to evangelism. Because this sort of commercialism that's been applied to the new age, stripping things of their context, is also applied to religions. Now forgive me, I'm British. Um, I, I have lived in the United States, in the Deep South, where these massive evangelical churches are found. Although I actually lived in the French Quarter of New Orleans, which of course is, is Catholic. The outskirts of uh, New Orleans do contain these large evangelical churches. And I just find them to be run on such business-like lines. I, I want to say that I'm sure that much of the congregation are good, honest people. I, I, I don't want to take that from them. Uh, but I find the emphasis on... Well, money, but donations, building the organisation, somewhat offensive. And, of course, you don't need me to tell you about the many, many scandals surrounding the founders of these evangelical churches. But my bigger misgivings are they too often see people on another path, at best as misguided, but sometimes even as satanic. They therefore aggressively evangelise, particularly in places like West Africa. Indeed, evangelism is sold like any other product. And if, if somebody tries to convert you to their views, you're left with a distinct impression that they're somehow incentivised like salespeople. Often the reason they give for their aggressive tactics is it's to save our souls from going to hell. But this really does create animosity, even hatred towards others on a different path. Rather dubious magical traditions appear to have been made up by evangelists to prove that others are worshipping Satan. Um, and it seems to me that it's completely incongruous that religions purporting to be about love seem to be promoting the exact opposite. I'm also concerned that one definition of black magic is imposing your will on others. And I would include evangelism within that definition. So quite the opposite of what they're arguing. I would see their emphasis on imposing their will as dangerously close to black magic. Now, I don't want you to think that I'm just having a go at Southern Baptists or American evangelical churches. I'm not. And many of you Christians may be surprised to find that these Christian evangelical movements are mirrored within Islam. And as a convert to Islam, I'm a magnet for these Muslim evangelists who speak to me like I'm not a Muslim and that I know nothing about Islam, which I find somewhat offensive. I'm often accused of shrik, which is a bit like idolatry, something I really don't do, although I hasten to add, I certainly don't condemn it. Uh, but the definition, their definition of shrik 
can be so strict that it would even include not having photos of the dead. Uh, and, and I mean, you know, photos of your dead relatives, for example. Now, they would accuse me of shrik, but my definition of shrik is acting in a godlike manner. So therefore, their judging of others, to my mind, is shrik. Now, they portray their beliefs as a majority, a true path and a return to basics. But like Christian evangelists, they are in fact a small minority. Who knows what the original Christians and Muslims actually believed and behaved like? But the significant evidence that they were more spiritual than we are today and more Gnostic. In other words, they were keen to explore differences and not at all rigid as the evangelists would have us believe. Like these Christian movements, the Muslim evangelists place great emphasis on a legalistic interpretation of Al-Quran. So they almost read, the evangelists almost read the Bible and Al-Quran almost as a lawyer would reading case law. They rely on the fact that few people can actually read and understand Arabic well enough to really know what's in Al-Quran as translations are not really considered Al-Quran. Indeed, it uses this sort of psychological manipulation that we, we all feel that we should know more about our religion and the holy books to make us feel ashamed. But, you know, if, even if we think of the Bible, it's so large. Can anyone really know all that's contained in it? I know there's there's many people who know the Gospels backwards, but, you know, when we get to the Old Testament, few people really know all that's in it. And both Christian and, and Muslim evangelists play on this by quoting from the Scriptures. Like Christian evangelists, these Muslim evangelists selectively quote from al Quran hoping that no one knows it well enough to argue with them. And the truth is, few people do. But they do so. I get the impression that they've learned these quotes. They don't have an actual understanding of the holy book. They've learned these quotes, as a salesperson does, when handling objections. Also, the truth is that Al-Quran should be recited and as a Kajawan, I believe that it's the sound of the words that's important, rather than the meaning, and certainly not the meaning that another is imposing upon it. Upon it. Again, these movements don't appear to question existing power relationships, and more often are used to support them. So, for example, the same could be said of Sharia which simply means an Islamic interpretation of the law, not necessarily the barbaric punishments it's seen as in the West. But it's often applied only to the poor, and those in power ignore the law in a very hypocritical way. Now, I actually believe that only God has a right to judge and punish, and therefore I'm even uneasy about civil law. Uh, but at least civil law within countries that call themselves democracies, there is something of a democratic process by which those who do the judging are appointed. Whereas all too often in Sharia, it's those who shout the loudest. I, I just wanted to add a few final thoughts. Let me reiterate it. It's absolutely not my intention to criticise another's path. Be that a spiritual path, a new age, be it a Christian evangelism or Muslim evangelism. I don't believe I've got any right to do so, and certainly I've got no desire to do so. But I would like to say that I personally would like to be left alone in my beliefs. I do, however, feel sorry for those people that I believe are duped by some of the more extreme commercialisations 
of both spirituality and religion. <coughs> Maybe you feel that that comment's too strong. But what I do detect is in inauthenticity and some manipulation that go on, which are incongruous with spirituality and religion. I would say that I always also see myself as a truth seeker. And whenever I experience subterfuge, I feel an obligation to expose it for what it is. And I, my views are best summed up by, it's always loudest in the shallow end of the swimming pool. Thank you and God bless you. Well, I really hope you've enjoyed this. Because these are real events, I can't say how reg regularly I'm going to be adding to this subsection. Um, you know, because I don't know how often they're going to occur. But I would imagine that they'll be at least every couple of months, maybe monthly. Now, if you'd like to know when that's going to be, please subscribe and hit the button and you'll get information on, on when new ones are released. I'd love you to make comments and ask questions. And if you do, I'll, I'll attempt to answer them as honestly as I can. I promise you that there's no attempt on this, this channel or this part of this channel of me, there'll be no attempt by me at any type of subterfuge. I'll try to be as honest and open as I possibly can be. Inevitably, there will be some of you who disagree with my interpretation. And, you know, we can agree to disagree. Um, but what you're seeing is real stuff here. What I'd love you to do, if you enjoyed this, is look at my other sections. Particularly... I've written novels about magic in Java and they contain much more information in them, especially me trying to understand the theories of magic, the psychology of it, and I try and intersperse them with a sort of spiritual dimension. Anyway, thank you so much for watching and God bless you.